Hi Rod, welcome back to 10 by 6. Thanks for having me on again. Continuing on with the theme of looking at global economics and the way in which certain organisations and certain ideologies are being used to effectively control all nations in one way or another for different ends. We're looking today at the, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and their, should we say, their complicit roles in pursuing yeah. a particular ideological outcome. And, and the derivation of that, of course, is ultimately control. So over to you, Rod. Thank you very much for that introduction. So, yeah, so uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about how rigged the international economic system is and it transfers vast amounts of wealth every year from poorer countries to richer countries. And so today we're going to talk about the three biggest or most important organizations that enforce this uh, system. And I came across a great, uh, a great quote uh, when I was researching this. In fact, I've got a couple of uh, quotes today, but this is a really good one by the economist Michael Hudson, who in my opinion is probably the world's leading expert on the, uh, how the global economic system works. And he said, the purpose of a military conquest is to take control of foreign economies, to take control of their land and impose tribute. The genius of the World Bank was to recognize that it's not necessary to occupy a country in order to impose tribute or to take over its industry, agriculture and land. Instead of bullets, it uses financial maneuvering. As long as other countries play an artificial economic game that US diplomacy can control, finance is able to achieve today what used to require bombing and loss of life by soldiers. And I think that's a great summary of, of how the system works. So if we go back in time to 1944, there was a really important meeting of uh, the British and American governments. So remember, this was towards the end of World War II, and these governments recognized that they were going to win World War II, and they were having a meeting to decide how the economic system would operate, the global economic system would operate um, in the future. So this was called the, Bre the meeting at Bretton Woods, and the organizations that came out of that meeting were called the Bretton Woods Institutions. So two of them are called the IMF and the World Bank, and we sort of talk about them as a pair because these days they're quite similar. And then there was a third one that at the time had the name GATT, that stands for Global Agreement and Trade and Tariffs. Now that name has gone and that gradually changed over time to become the World Trade Organization or the WTO. And so that's the third organization that I'm going to talk about. So we'll start with the IMF and the World Bank. Now, initially, when they were set up, they had reasonably specific purposes. So the World Bank was intended to provide loans to countries for development, so particularly poor countries. And then the IMF is what's known as a lender of last resort. It steps in to provide funding for a government when uh, its uh, finances look as if they're in trouble. Now, gradually over time, their purposes have kind of uh, expanded, they've overlapped, and so now, they, they, they sort of look like two institutions that, that seem to do very, very similar things. Now, it's important to understand right from the outset that the heads of these organizations, uh, they're never democratically elected. And so in particular, the World Bank always has an American leader. So the first full-time leader of the World Bank was a guy came, named John McCloy. Now he'd been the American Assistant Secretary of War uh, in the early 1940s. So he, his interests were firmly those of the United States government. And then sometime later on, the World Bank was headed by a guy that I consider to be an insane sociopath, whose name was Paul Wolfowitz. And he became notorious years ago because he actively supported dictators in other countries, such as Suharto in Indonesia, who was committing genocide. So you can see when you start to look at the senior personnel in these organizations, what their, their true motives might be. It's about structuring the global economic system in a way that, uh, that works for the United States. And 
what's important to understand, and we've talked about this a little bit before, is that when either of these organisations loans money to a country, always there are conditions with the loan. And the conditions will tend to be the things that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which is the privatisation of, of existing major industries, such as the water supply or energy supplies. It's austerity, so that's lower spending by governments. And it's deregulation. This means less regulation for big business and particularly for financiers. And the World Bank in particular makes loans to help countries develop export crops. But as we've seen in the past, when countries start growing something, let's say coffee, well, they can have all sorts of problems with the coffee trade. But growing food for export is the opposite of creating food security within that nation. And again, we've talked about that a little bit in the past. So the policies that uh, the World Bank and the IMF uh, insist upon, uh, along with their loans, have been applied now to over 100 countries. And in nearly every single one, the outcomes have been disastrous. So large job losses um, and huge problems with uh, people getting enough food uh, and things like that. And in fact, uh, at one point, people used to nickname the IMF, I am fired, because there were so many job losses that went along with these conditions. And various people will have heard in the past of uh, countries like Rwanda, which had a major war in the 1990s, where there was huge slaughter, and Yugoslavia, which had a major war also in the 1990s. What you don't hear talked about in the mainstream press is that both Rwanda and Yugoslavia had been um, seriously impacted by conditions attached to uh, loans received from the IMF or the World Bank. And this had um, increased any feeling of civil unrest that existed within the country. So in fact, the, the policies sometimes are so extreme that they lead uh, ultimately to, uh, to civil war. And in fact, the World Bank has admitted that it expects its own policies to cause civil unrest. And they admit um, that they are what we've called in the past shock therapy, where it's the policies are imposed very quickly and they're going to have serious negative consequences for the populations of those countries. And there are many occasions that have been well documented where IMF staff have actually disagreed with the policies that their bosses have insisted be implemented uh, in, in these countries. So not every single person at the IMF or the World Bank is necessarily uh, an evil person, but the policies they implement consistently have negative consequences. And what is interesting is that if you look at the countries that have been more successful uh, over the last 50 years or so, particularly China and Malaysia, they were very, very keen to retain controls on the movement of money. So they did not implement the policies that the IMF and the World Bank uh, have, uh, have enforced elsewhere. And various insiders from these organizations have come forward and admitted the problems uh, that were caused and that many senior people know that these problems are going to happen. So in the past, we've talked about the famous book by Joseph Stiglitz, the world, the former chief economist to the World Bank. So his book was called Globalization and Its Discontents. But other insiders have come forward, too. So uh, one insider said, Everything we did from 1983 onwards was based on our new sense of mission to have the South privatized or die. Towards this end, we created economic bedlam in Latin America and Africa from 1983 to 1988. So that was one particular insider talking about the period when he was there. Another insider admitted that in 2002, the American government, this was remembered just after the September the 11th, terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, the American government had a meeting with the World Bank, and they said that the World Bank is a tool to enforce privatization in other countries. And that was to be the role of the World Bank. And then the US Treasury has admitted that the World Bank is an institution solidly dominated by the United States, faithfully promoting not only strategic US economic goals, but short-term political objectives as well. 
So if you if you have a are unfortunate unfortunate enough to sit through mainstream economics lectures at university, the standard presentation is, hey, the IMF and the World Bank, they're these good guys trying to provide funding to all these poor countries, and isn't that wonderful? But actually, it's not really true. And in fact, there was a, another insider whose name is John Perkins, and he's become quite famous because he wrote a book a few years ago called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And in fact, uh, more recently, he's, he's written an updated version called New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And if anybody really wants to see the detail of how the IMF functions to manipulate developing countries, his books are well worth reading. And so he points out that teams from the IMF would go to a developing country that wanted to, uh, to borrow some money, and they take with them lots of fake projections about how well the economy would do if they followed the policies that the IMF wanted. So they project that the economy would grow, jobs would be created, and everything would be, would be wonderful. And of course, they all the insiders who were on these teams knew that these were fake projections. And in fact, the power of these organizations is not really uh, understood, but it's actually so great, it hugely distorts politics in other countries. Uh, and so uh, in South Korea, they were having some presidential elections. I'm sorry, I haven't got the date for this one, but all four candidates before the elections took place had to agree that if they got elected, they would enforce IMF policies. OK, and so the South Korean one, that's just one example out of many. The IMF is operating behind the scenes to manipulate politics and the economic system in country after country all the time. Now, in fact, more in the last 20 years or so, a few countries have been trying really hard to escape from the clutches of the IMF. So in 2003, Thailand revoked all the laws that they had introduced because of IMF pressure, so they got rid of them. In 2020, Costa Rica um, had such serious protests that they were also forced to reverse policies that the IMF had insisted upon. And then there's a great example with Argentina. In 2006, the Argentinian government tried to get rid of all its, uh, its sort of debt to the IMF, and it tried to change the laws, and the leader was uh, quoted as saying, no way in hell will we ever agree to IMF policies ever again. 10 years later, a new president gets into power in Argentina. So this is 2016, President Macri, and he was an American, what we used to call a puppet leader. These days we probably call it a client uh, leader. So he was firmly in bed with the United States government. And again, he took money from the IMF and agreed to their policies. So whilst ordinary people in lots of countries are resisting very hard against what's going on, it's incredibly difficult because in most countries, there is a small group of powerful people who, if they manage to get into power, will implement these policies because they know it, it benefits themselves. So if we now have a little look at the World Trade Organization, this um, the first two focus on finance. So the World Bank and the IMF focus on finance. The World Trade Organization focuses on trade. So in the past, that used to just mean buying and selling uh, goods. But in fact, they've expanded what they deal with to include services. And so you see all sorts of agreements such as they have one called TRIPS, which stands for the Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property. And so that's to do with patents. And so the WTO <laughs> tries to make sure that patents are enforced. Now the WTO claims to aim for a level playing field, but as we've seen in earlier discussions, you can't have a level playing field when you start out with great inequality. It will always be biased in favor of the rich and the powerful, the big international companies and so on. And if you look closely at the small print of WTO agreements, that you start to realize that actually there is much more clear cut bias built into their regulations. So for example, they have quite strict rules on different types of subsidies. So this is where a government gives assistance to different companies. And you realize that those subsidies are actually biased towards rich countries. 
So governments are allowed to provide subsidies for research, which is useful to help companies in advanced nations, but they're not allowed to provide subsidies to protect what are called infant industries, so small developing industries. But in fact, it's the infant industry protection that poorer countries need, but the WTO stops them from doing that. And I came across a weird example, what I thought was a weird example, that since 1994, the WTO rules say that customs officials cannot challenge the declared value on imports and exports. So this, in theory, was a way to get rid of bureaucracy when you're importing and exporting goods. But if an, um, a customs official has to believe what's written on the side of every import or export, then it becomes very easy for companies to lie about the values of their imports and exports. And that enables them to engage in things we've talked about in the past where they manipulate prices and pretend that their profits are made in other countries, in tax havens, and they can get away with tax evasion. So the WTO rules end up helping big companies get away with tax evasion. And there's all sorts of uh, sort of little things in the small print that, that create bias in favor of powerful players. Now, in the past, WTO negotiations used to appear uh, occasionally in the mainstream press. And the negotiations tend to be based around the idea of trade-offs. That means if rich countries make a concession, then poor countries are also expected to make a concession. But that's nonsensical when you start with this power imbalance in favor of rich countries. What poor countries need is not trade-offs, but what they need is actually the rules to change and change and keep changing in their favor to help them develop was at the moment they're um, they're rigged in favor of the rich and the powerful. So the existing imbalances in wealth and power mean that the idea of trade offs uh, in negotiations makes no sense for poor countries. And in fact, many of the negotiations are actually carried out in secret. So a handful of advanced nations will meet behind the scenes, they'll determine policy, and the poorer countries just have to accept it. And at the peak of the, the WTO's power, there were approximately 1,000 WTO meetings per year. Now, if you're a rich country, you can employ lots of staff to go to all of these meetings. But poor countries simply did not have the staff to attend uh, all these meetings. And in fact, in the poorest countries, they don't have a single permanent member of staff who is in, expected to go to these, these meetings. So, of course, it becomes impossible for them to negotiate uh, in a meaningful way. Whereas the rich countries, not only do they have a whole uh, large permanent staff, but behind the scenes, they also have thousands of corporate lawyers advising those staff uh, and trying to manipulate the regulations. So there's this massive imbalance in the ability to negotiate. So the WTO always claims that what it wants to do is to help poor countries, but every aspect of its operation shows clearly that uh, it's about exploiting um, poor countries. And every now and again, people will talk about tariffs. These are sort of uh, extra taxes that are imposed on imports. And again, the WTO says, well, we want to help rich countries eliminate those tariffs to make it a fairer playing field for poor countries. But in fact, if you look at the tariffs that exist, it's quite clear that advanced nations are not really attempting to get rid of their tariffs and the WTO is not forcing them to do so. So there's a great deal of sort of propaganda or smoke and mirrors in relation to what is said. And what I just mentioned about the corporate lawyers behind the scenes is that various researchers have realized that actually the rules that the WTO come up with are often actually written by the biggest US companies. So there's a big grain company called Cargill, which drafted the regulations on trade in agriculture. And then the lawyers at Pfizer, who are in the news quite a lot in relation to COVID these days, uh, they drafted the, the rules on intellectual um, property. Now, every now and again, there's uh, um, governments from different countries will contest uh, 
certain regulations and so on, or certain interpretations of regulations. And so the WTO will have a panel of experts to hold a hearing to make an assessment of how these rules should be interpreted. But of course, various researchers again have found that the panels of experts who are chosen come from corporate backgrounds, they're experts in trade, but they're not experts in health or safety or the environment. And over and over again, the WTO panels will rule in favor of big companies and against developing countries being able to, uh, to introduce legislation for various uh, purposes. And interestingly enough, in uh, the year 2000, the WTO actually ruled that US tax policy is unfair. And this caused quite a consternation in the US and many other advanced nations, because up until that point, no one had actually realized the WTO was this powerful and the penalties that they impose can be quite severe. Now, they'll never get away with imposing penalties on the United States because the US is too powerful, but they impose penalties on poorer countries all the time. And that has, that has serious detrimental consequences for poor countries. And ultimately it undermines democracy. Now I've got quite a long quote that came from one researcher who summarized these rulings. And he said, acting as the supreme global adjudicator, the WTO has ruled against laws deemed barriers to free trade. It has forced Japan to accept greater pesticide residues in imported food. It has kept Guatemala from outlawing deceptive advertising on, of baby food. It has eliminated the ban in various countries on asbestos and on fuel economy and emission standards for motor vehicles. It has ruled against marine life protection laws and the ban on endangered species products. The European Union's prohibition on the importation of hormone-ridden US beef had overwhelming popular support throughout Europe, but a three-member WTO panel decided the ban was an illegal restraint on trade. The decision on beef put in jeopardy a host of other food import regulations based on health concerns. The WTO overturned a portion of the US Clean Air Act banning certain additives in gasoline because it interfered with imports from foreign refineries. And so you start to see that in a practical sense, the WTO keeps making decisions that actually undermine democratic decisions uh, in lots of countries, including in advanced nations. So there's a big sort of question mark, why do politicians agree to these policies? And it's important to understand the vast majority of politicians don't understand what they're signing up to at all. So there's a, great, um, uh, there's a great series of events in 1995. So some of your viewers will have heard of a consumer lobbyist in America called Ralph Nader. And in 1995, he offered $10,000 to any politician in the United States who would read the WTO agreement that was about to be debated and signed into US law. And one Senator in America took up the offer and he read the whole thing and they are huge. They're about hundreds and hundreds of pages long of quite dense legal uh, text. So quite hard going, but one Senator read it. He was the one person who voted against it. And so this is the other thing. All the other politicians in a country like America, they're voting for it because their corporate lobbyists are bribing them to vote for it because it's in the interests of the corporate lobbyists. In poorer countries, the reasons are a bit more complex Sometimes they don't fully understand what they're voting for. To some extent, they just want to be part of the mainstream system because they will believe, they believe, or some of them believe it will be good for them. But also perhaps most importantly is that with these agreements, often small groups of elites, powerful people, business owners will benefit in these countries. And so they lobby their government to support these agreements but always it's the rich and the powerful who benefit and everybody else, particularly the poor, loses out. And so in fact, one uh, person did a great deal of research. In fact, there was a book written a few years ago called Behind the Scenes at the WTO. And they concluded that the WTO is the place where governments collude in private against their domestic pressure groups. So you start to realize you've got rich and powerful people in every country and they're rigging the system to benefit themselves. 
Now, some people, some critical writers describe the WTO, the World Bank and the IMF as the unholy trinity, that they're sort of interchangeable masks for a single system. And, and one researcher called them the ministries of trade and finance for a world government, where the focus always is on corporate profits. Now, what's interesting is that we could easily restructure the whole economic system to focus on something, let's say, like food security. But actually, there are so many powerful players in advanced nations that nobody is, is really pursuing uh, that goal. The only people who are pursuing that goal are a handful of governments around the world, like I mentioned earlier, such as China. Uh, Malaysia, certainly in the past, was doing so, uh, and so on. Now, things are gradually changing. So in the last few years, negotiations at the WTO have just collapsed. Poor countries have realized that the whole system is basically to screw them. And over the years, there were additional agreements, as I mentioned at the beginning, on patents, investments, various types of services. So that could be trying to uh, take the healthcare system and put it in private hands and so on. Uh, and poor countries are now resisting this. So from the, the whole period 2001 to 2015, the negotiations just collapsed. They made no progress and nobody would sign anything. And in May 2020, the head of the WTO resigned saying that it's going nowhere, that this is not really a viable way to, uh, to do trade agreements. Now, just because the WTO is dying doesn't mean that the problems are disappearing. So a lot of what we call trade agreements are more accurately described as agreements about the rights of investors. Uh, and there are various kind of secret agreements or semi-secret agreements, which have the title ISDS. That stands for Investor State Dispute Settlement. And this is like a secret court similar to the panels of the WTO, but these now exist outside the WTO, and it, they give um, companies the opportunity to sue governments for potential lost future profits. Now, that if you think that through, that's just kind of insane. So if a government wants to introduce legislation to stop the use of, say, poisonous chemicals in products, if, if a company thinks that that's going to affect its profits for any time in the future, it can sue the government for compensation. And every big company can sue every government for potential lost future profits. So we've, they're creating sort of parallel legal universe, uh, which is open only to companies, to the biggest companies, international corporations. And the rulings that are coming out would not occur under domestic laws. And it's even got to the point, strangely enough, where if a domestic government um, stops um, a company from doing certain things, and there's been examples where senior people within the company are convicted of certain crimes in order for that criminal to avoid being sent to prison, they're starting to sue the government through the ISDS, if that makes sense. So it's a bizarre kind of inversion of a, of a legal system where you threaten governments in order to stop the normal legal system operating uh, at all. And so the threat of um, uh, taking governments through the ISDS and suing them is, has been enough so far for many governments to roll back what are called public interest laws, those that protect people, employees, the environment, consumers, uh, and so on. So these international secret courts are incredibly powerful and it's something we need to keep an eye on. And ideally we need to eliminate them because they're just not consistent uh, with democracy. Okay, that's probably quite a good place to, uh, to end. Yes, thank you so much, Rod, thank you. Um, I'm gonna start at the end with the ISDS. I think that's probably a, a good place to start. I had this, this, this issue. Okay, so you've got these so-called secret international courts, but what stops the democratically or not so democratically elected leaders, governments, parties, etc., of these nations to simply ignore them? So I think it's about the power imbalance. So 
Uh, the, there's been existing examples over the years. So uh, I'm going to go back to when Cuba had a revolution. They overthrew their dictatorship and they, uh, they uh, went forward with a socialist sort of economic system. And one of the things that Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader, has explained to leaders of other countries, let's say in South America, who are wanting to have their own revolutions, is that the worst mistake he ever made was throwing out the international bankers because they made life hell for Cuba ever since, that actually you do need to stay on friendly terms with the international bankers. And so poor countries are very afraid that if they ignore the ISDS rulings, the consequences that can be imposed upon them by powerful nations are so severe, then uh, it will be worse than just complying with the ISDS um, rulings. Does that make sense? It, it absolutely makes sense, but it also then triggers in my mind this idea that why not have all these multiple countries forming alliances? So basically they all say stuff you. Yeah, well, so I hope one day they will, and they form partial alliances. So I'm no expert in these sort of alliances, but certainly certain uh, South American countries have tried to form alliances and Asian countries are forming ver uh, various alliances. And in fact, that's becoming more powerful now in Asia because of China's power and so on. And I think to some extent, they are trying to say, uh, fuck you, but I think it's extremely difficult with the way the global trade system exists at the moment, that starting from where we are now, people are so, some countries are so dependent on certain exports, certain imports and so on, that it becomes very, very difficult um, for people to just say, no, we're not gonna do that. And I've often wondered actually, why a country like Britain doesn't actually say, we will no longer be a part of and just take a part of a WTO uh, system and say, we're gonna withdraw from that, that agreement. Um, but it, I, I never see any examples in the media of mainstream politicians in advanced nations saying, actually, we need to withdraw from some of these agreements. So for whatever reasons, they seem to feel it necessary to stay within the system, whether they could just completely withdraw and say, you know, let's say Jeremy Corbyn had got elected and he came along and said, we're just going to withdraw from the IMF, the World Bank and the WTO. What would be the consequence? I think we probably could, but it may be quite difficult. Yeah, I wasn't so much thinking about the UK. I was more thinking about, you know, many of the African nations, for example, uniting together and, 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 and taking back autonomy. And then thinking of these, if South Americans, or at least some South Americans and Central American nations did it, and like you say, some Asian ones, and once they've established themselves, then they all come together and say, stuff you. And then, you know, if the Americans want to come in and trample in or try and bribe them or whatever, they just say, no, we're going to do things our own way from now on. And we, we might have to struggle for half a century or a century, but we've been struggling for multiple centuries anyway. So it's not making an awful lot of difference. Well, from what I've seen, there are enough very bad leaders in many of the poor countries yes, who are essentially US, US clients, that yes. they don't want to uh, remove themselves from no. these agreements. They, they like the agreements. Yes. So at any given moment in time, you would only have a handful of nations, I think, who, who wanted to work together. And as we saw with the Argentina case, where they were trying to extricate themselves from IMF conditions, once Argentina yes. elected a different leadership, they were right back at square one. And I think this pattern, this cycle repeats itself over and over again in country yes. after country. Yes. It's yeah, no, I, I, I get that. Yeah, and, and I think that leads very much into this comparison between the WTO and the, and the IMF in that it is, in fact, a, a classic example of being anti-democratic. So whatever propaganda and... Um, lip service is being played, paid, sorry, to, to us and the public across the planet. Ultimately, what they're doing is the opposite. Yes, I agree. I think that's a really good point. And, you know, I get really frustrated at university that I would uh, be talking to academics 
and they would they would believe without question that Britain and Europe and America all really believe in democracy in other countries. And yet, once you start to look at the workings of the international system, you start to believe you start to realize that they don't really care about democracy in other countries. That actually they care about their own interests and the interests of their their companies and their lobbyists and so on. But they don't seem to care about dem democracy in their own countries either, to be fair. <laughs> well, these days it's becoming more and more obvious that Britain and America are not what any ordinary person would call functioning democracies. That you've got, we've talked about it before, the illusion of democracy. But uh, in fact, it makes no difference to ordinary people and inequality is going through the roof and so on. So you're, you're absolutely right that democracy is this wonderful kind of term that everybody assumes that everybody kind of buys into but in in practice the most powerful people really really don't care about democracy at all and, and also i've noticed that, that when people use critical thinking about their own country let's take the uk for example you'll then get the retorts well let's compare us to afghanistan let's compare us to to libya let's consider, compare us to china um, but the, what they don't understand or seem to, to get hold of is that the countries that they're comparing the UK to have them in themselves been completely screwed by the yes. likes of us in order yeah. to create an example of a country that they perceive doesn't work very well. Whereas if we maybe left them to it, it would be the populations of Libya and China and Afghanistan, who'll be looking over to the UK and say, you don't want to live like that, do you? So, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I think this idea, actually, about uh, how uh, Britain, America, Europe, again, all the advanced nations screw so many other countries, but it's never discussed in the mainstream press. And uh, that, that we play a very significant role in holding back these countries uh, is, is really important. Yes, no, absolutely. I've only got a couple of other points because you were so thorough and it's also quite technical. So it's, it's difficult to, to have a, sure. a conversation about it. And, and also there's a lot of crossovers, as you've said, with stuff that we've, we've discussed before. Yeah. Um, one of the things that sort of stood out for me and linked to everything we've said so far is very much that the conditions that are attached to IMF loans. Now, whether they're in the UK in 1976 or whether in any other country before or after, the actual outcome, and it's something almost that we need to get across, is it leads to a small number of people in power who have that, who have that power killing other people. You know, their policies kill. Austerity kills. Um, or it creates you know serious mental health issues which as a secondary people take their own lives so you know we have to make this really really clear this is not um, a benign this is a very malignant um organizations who are impacting on nations in a very very malignant way absolutely i think that's a really good point and uh, you can see the, 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 the most negative results in the poorest countries because their social safety nets are so weak. And so you see lots of uh, people suffering from mal malnutrition, people dying, all sorts of things. We have the same things happening in more advanced nations because of policies such as austerity. And it's not so obvious. But uh, during the week, I actually sat and watched uh, I, Daniel Blake, which for anyone who doesn't know, uh, is a movie made a couple of years ago about what it's like for uh, the people who are suffering the most in the UK in terms of uh, claiming benefits, not being able to get a job and so on, and having to jump through hoops and get entangled in this terrible bureaucracy and how people will turn to prostitution and then people are at food banks because they don't have enough money to buy food. And I ha have a suspicion that this is happening all over the world and particularly in the last two years because of covid it's got worse and worse and worse and what people forget uh is that we're living in one of the most advanced nations one of the wealthiest nations in history at a time in history when we should be able to provide a really good 
quality of life for every single person who lives here. And yet that is not something that government cares about at all. And so these policies are having very severe consequences. Yes, and, and I think I, Daniel Blake, is one of those examples. It's like a litmus test. You put everybody in a room and you force them to watch it. And those that, who aren't banging the table and demanding radical change, you lock up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, so I think that would be good. I'm going to try and persuade my brother, who lives in this little pocket of wealth in the southeast of England, to watch it because he's always saying, well, if there's only two million people at food banks, that means 96% of the population are doing just fine. And he, he just doesn't sort of get how hard life is for the poorer half of the population. Which shows, not, I'm not talking about your brother here, but it shows, unfortunately, decades and decades of ideological oppression that have sucked a lot of empathy out of so many people. Absolutely. And I, I think the, the question about empathy is really... It's really important. And, and in fact, I think I've mentioned it in terms of uh, knowing middle class people in India, that they have no empathy whatsoever with the poorest people. But I, I think you're right that uh, because of the way the media system works, uh, that people are doing reasonably well in, in, say, Britain today. They tend to think that that's the norm. And uh, if there's a handful of people who've fallen by the wayside well that's because they're lazy or stupid and they never actually stop to examine the way the system uh, is sort of loaded against those people uh, who are struggling and even those people that perceive themselves as doing well are beholden to great amounts of debt which take over much of their adult lives um you know, so that they might have these big houses, but they only it's only successful to them because they're comparing it to those people who don't have big houses. So basically it impacts upon their psychology in such a way as to make them feel somehow superior or better or whatever, which in itself is malignant, in itself is extremely unhealthy. Well, it, well, it is. And I think actually, I think the word unhealthy is, is a great word to use, that we are creating a very unhealthy society, not just in terms of not being able to get to hospital, literally an unhealthy society, but it's psychologically an unhealthy society. Uh, sort of referring back to what you're saying about the lack of empathy uh, and so on, that, uh, that what Margaret Thatcher used to say was there's no such thing as society. And she has brought that about. And we are moving more and more down the route where people feel there is less and less of a society. It's all about the individual, so on. And people forget that the way we became successful nations in the past was by working as a society, working together and so on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One thing I just wanted to mention that was in your articles um, about the inequalities between richer nations and poorer nations in terms of their attendance at committees at WTOs is it, it's, it's not just that they, they have to attend, let's say a thousand meetings a year. I think the, the problem you clearly identified in your article is that a lot of these meetings are put at the same time. So it actually makes it extremely difficult for those people who don't have the resources to send attendees um, well, you have to make choices. And if you make a choice to go to A, you're having absolutely no influence and impact upon B. Um, at which you, you ask, is that a sinister um, decision making on behalf of the WTO to ensure that, you know, that you don't have those attendees? Or is it about time? I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know, but ultimately the outcome is, is the same. <laughs> Yeah, I think you raise an interesting point, and it's something I've been sort of reflecting on more uh, recently. In that, with all the with any negotiations that I come across these days, and whether that's the WTO stuff or whether that's a sort of union uh, negotiating with their employers and so on, there seems to be more and more complexity involved, and it's harder and harder for those with fewer resources to participate at all. Whereas those who have the resources, the rich and the powerful and the employers, they can drag these negotiations on for years, they employ lawyers and so on. And 
from their point of view, it doesn't matter if negotiations drag on for years. They're doing fine. They're still earning a very good living. Mm. Whereas if the union members are out on strike, and this is actually happening uh, at the moment with the university employees, yes. uh, that the many of them are on strike, many of them are suffering financially. And it's very, very difficult to... Uh, to negotiate on an equal footing with the employees. There is this power imbalance created through bureaucracy. And I, I think I see that more and more in the way various systems uh, work. Yes, and, and, and to finish off, Rod, you also have in this country, sadly now, a Labour Party who doesn't really care. Yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. And um, oddly enough, I've been trying to explain this to a number of uh, Labour Party members and other sort of uh, campaigners who don't seem to realize that Keir Starmer is firmly a member of the establishment. He has no interest in doing anything which will undermine the way the system works. He does, he's not interested in representing the, the poor people and the underprivileged and so on. He's only in it for his own future and to maintain the future of the establishment. And, you know, it's incredibly difficult to convince people uh, of this sort of thing. So uh, you keep working on it and you keep hoping that people will work it out eventually over time. But it was a bit like when Barack Obama came to power in America and he had these great speeches and he was saying hope and change. And in fact, we've seen the same thing all over again with Joe Biden coming to power in America. And I know lots of left wing campaigners who hated Donald Trump and they're all saying, well, Biden's doing some good speeches, isn't he? He's saying the right things. And that's what Barack Obama did. He made great speeches and he said the right things. But actually, all the policies that he implemented were very much about let's continue with foreign wars. Let's have the same bankers who destroyed the system as my main advisory panel with the banking and the, the corporate system and so on. That he, he wasn't interested in bringing about any change. And no doubt that will be the same with, with Biden in America and so on. So, uh, yeah, people have to kind of be alert to the fact that what people say and the sort of the, the presentation of their character and so on has nothing to do with the reality. And that at the moment, all the leaders we're seeing from either main party are very much establishment uh, figures. And we, we can only hope that more people sort of wake up to this and demand change, particularly in the Labour Party, as that would be the obvious place uh, to start. Yeah, and, and, and also we both know and, and many other people know also that that both <clears throat> the American president and the head of or the leader of the opposition in this country, the influence that they probably have in choosing the people that they have around them, we, we mustn't fall under this impression that they have total autonomy. Yes, that's true. That's true. And, and in fact, this is uh, something we've talked about in the past, that behind the scenes of any government, you have this giant bureaucracy, which has very strong connections to big business and so on. And the bureaucracy of people who are there for the whole of their lives, much of the time, they're, they're career bureaucrats, uh, whereas the politicians come and go and they move between departments and so on. And so the power structures tend to be much more behind the scenes. And it's something that, again, the media and the general public really don't talk about enough in terms of understanding how the political system works. Yeah, and, and, and for, my, for me, the, the population is on a continuum. And let's just pretend that they're etymologists, you know? So they're in, a, they're in a satellite in space and they're looking out the window and they're looking down to see whether they can see insects and what those insects are doing that's a large number of the population who still get to vote. And then you get the etymologists who are on their knees in the forests, in the woods, in the fields, with magnifying glasses and all the required equipment. And they're the ones who, like us, are trying to explain how insects live their lives. And yet the ones who are in the satellites, they still think that they're best placed. Yeah, I think that's quite a good, that's quite a good analogy, actually that uh, you, you really do have to do some serious digging to, uh, to, and get up close to the subject to, to really understand it well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rod. Another amazing, another amazing week and another amazing analysis of the topics. You take care and I'll see you next week. Yep. See you next week, everybody. Bye-bye.